People sometimes think about what music can add, such as atmosphere at a party or a wedding. You may have been to either, or indeed both. It's the same with subdued lighting, given the correct candle and indeed lampshade choice. But more importantly, it's what music can give. Excitement, gratification, empathy and comfort. So with this general ethos in mind, let me not add, but give to you, Bell and Sebastian.
to say to you, the audience, and the, the people, indeed the fan base, uh, welcome. Questions will be asked and hopefully answers garnered. When you regrouped to make the new record, uh, how had the dynamics in the band changed after a four year break? And was it easy to get back and start writing again or did you have to sort of ease yourselves into it? It is a really good question and the answer is sort of unfolding the, the whole time, you know. Um, a little bit close to the bone as well. You do find as you, as you get older, you, um, certain things are accentuated in, in people, you know, and like uh, certain things about me will annoy like the rest of the band more than ever and maybe something annoys me and all that kind of stuff. With the, the album before, it, we had a lot more songs in the pool that we, you know, we kind of worked on and then we kind of dropped some along the way, whereas this one, it was, we kind of condensed it before we went into the studio. When we finished in 2006, um, I think for a band of seven people, we were in really good shape. You know, we're in good form. We're good. You know, we're, we were good pals. Nobody had fallen out with each other, and you know that kind of thing. If we say we'd got to the end of a big tour, and we we're thinking, oh my god, I can't do this, or somebody had said to the press, okay, that's it, we split up or something. But we hadn't. We were just like, we it was like, job done. Let's have a break. So we, when we came back together, it was like just getting on a bike again. I had to laugh though that Jeff at Rough Trade had a sort of word in our ear when we said, you know, Jeff, we're going to take a bit of a break. And he said, yes, I think that's for the best. OK, glad we could all make it. As you can probably see, I've got the notes. I think that today, and after what feels like weeks of attrition for just about everyone, we finally have the basis of a plan. Start the campaign months before the record comes out. Make announcements and generate a little bit of press excitement before the record is even finished. You bombard people with tweets, Facebook messages, mail outs to try and get them to buy the album. Release a low budget video or a, a film clip around the time of release. Get the band to do every interview offered by every website, newspaper, magazine and radio session that can be squeezed in until the album is out. And by that time, everyone has lost interest and moved on to the next artist they're working on. That's the truth. See, I imagine there aren't any Godfrey's or Percy's in the audience. Is there a Margot? Point proved. Right, uh, next question is gentlemen over there. Uh, I just have a quick question on uh, the state of the music industry at the moment. Would you recommend coming artists to uh, try and go it alone? Or is there still a place for major labels? Is it still wise to sign? I do sort of, uh, you know, bump into people in bands who are younger younger bands and bands starting out and I'm always amazed at how that they, they get on and, and the, the level of music that they're producing when they haven't even, you know, been given any money and haven't been signed, nobody's really taken any interest in them. They ask me to listen to check their demos out or something like that and, you know, give them advice. And I go home and I'm like, bloody hell, you know, how did they make this? This is a, sounds better than our first record, you know, and they've made this at home. DIY, do it yourself. You know, this is the second big punk movement is the whole uh, internet thing. You know, it's just kicking in now. We can make the best music possible and, and, and people will uh, eventually hear it, I think. Is the, the centre of Bell and Sebastian on Earth. It's all happening here. This is where we sell our T-shirts, where we uh, rehearse downstairs. A couple of years ago, I bumped into a friend of mine at Byers Road, and during the course of the conversation, said to me, why would anybody buy an album? Why would anybody buy music? It's over, it's dead, it's finished. Why would anybody pay for music? It certainly did make me stop and think, is this the end of recorded music? Uh, what do we do? It's an interesting time. You know, times of kind of crisis can actually be really great for music. Mm -hmm. I actually think it's made for more interesting sounding records because you've taken that carrot away from people. You do 
help each other a lot more and kind of join together with other little bands and little labels. Bands really are doing it for themselves now. You know, they're not just bands, they're, they're, they're enterprises, they're, they're small businesses, and they're, they're really taking ownership of where they're going in their career. Do you still think of your records as your definitive thing? And like what you want to be remembered for. I do think we put a, a kind of a massive amount of thought and energy into the, into the making of records. It's not the case that if records in and of making records in and of themselves generated enough income for us to continue making records without having to play gigs, that we would stop playing gigs. There have always been the vast majority of people making mm. music, having day jobs, not making oh, no, really absolutely. memorable records, but you know, trying nonetheless. I don't really think about selling records, it's, and handily enough we don't, you know, so it works quite well. <laughs> a lot of the bands that come to us are sort of no longer labouring under this illusion that they're going to get signed and it's going to pay their rent and everything. A quote from Mick Jagger, uh, PayPal, no I'm not going to do that. <laughs> People only made money out of records for a very, very small time. I think at this point, I don't think um, anyone's doing it because they expect to make the next million selling record. For Bon Jovi to do what he did in the 80s, does he deserve to have like a plane or a swimming pool? <laughs> you know what I mean? Does it equate what, what, you know what I mean? In terms of doing a job and getting, sure. pay, getting paid accordingly, yeah. you know what I mean? Playing gigs in order to earn money, to save up money, to make a record, which puts us in debt, so we play more gigs to get back the money, and then make some more money, and then make a record, and that puts us back in debt, and it's just this this kind of circle. Was there any moments within recording or, or playing gigs or something where you just thought, I feel like I've done something here? Launching our first record felt like a first album. It's important to like not always keep like looking forward about what you've got to do next. That should just be like, well, actually, I've made a record. I've something I really, really wanted to do. And if that's all I do, then wow. Anybody got any good ideas about how to make a bit of cash? Do your own gigs and do your own bar. <laughs> Genius. That is where the money is. Do as many things you can for yourself without having to spread, you know, the, the income or revenue with other parties. Uh -huh. You know, what if you just want to tear it up? You know, well, you know, where's the next Smiths going to come from? Where's the next explosion going to come from? Uh -huh. And isn't that the most exciting thing? It's not just about music. You're talking about social and political change. Change of government. We've got, um, and we've got this whole. Uh, Thing, the music business being turned upside down by um, you know ways of selling so maybe there's something just around the corner you know it's been claimed love is the answer it's also been queried that if love is the answer what is the question that's something which can be confusing because the question could quite rightly be put as simply as what is the key to everlasting happiness? At the same time though, the same answer would be derived from the following question. What 60s band fronted by After Lee released the seminal Forever Changes album in 1967? Confusing times indeed. I may need to take a seat. Traveling light, echoing love at first sight, glimmering, glistening, waking up the darkest night, waiting for traveling light. Though the sun has yet to appear, inkling of faint perception is near. Chico. 
if you look over the last few months at similar bands in our ballpark, releasing records to roughly the same audience on similar sized labels. I'm talking about the E45s, Harold Bjornsson, Old Telescopes, The Sovereignty, they all spring to mind. Now these are identical campaigns. If it was left to the labels, everyone would be the same. Everyone. Was there a particular record in the first album that really brought you guys together as a group? The stuff that we had in, in common musically was probably the stuff that, that Andrew Devine was playing up at the art school and that, that um, Scott Bryan and the guys were playing at Goodfoot because mm. that was sort of that was sort of how our social lives overlapped in a way, wasn't it, and how we kind of got to know each other. So I, I guess at, at the time of the band getting together, it was probably more 60s stuff yeah. that we had in common rather than, rather than 80s stuff. Probably some of the others were into sort of Northern Soul sound before I was and um, I, I caught up to that a little bit later, but that became a very unifying like sound by about 1998 for us, where the, I remember specifically the only occasion where all eight of Bell and Sebastian at that time were out socially was maybe Goodfoot, which was a, a Northern Soul Club. And I was thinking, wow, we're all here. This might never happen again. <laughs> We've always been a band that like to use, you know, real instruments, and um, I think I think we kind of feel that orchestration brings, um, you know, makes a record a record. Stuart or one of the singers generally will bring in a song, and we rehearse it, uh, get the band arrangement together, and uh, we we demo that. So we we, put, we we do a recording in the rehearsal room. So yeah, after the demo is done, what we do next is we um, we take. Uh, sampled sounds, um, it's basically an, um, an orchestra sample. So that's, um, we've got cello, we've got um, some violins, um, we've got some tremolo violins, uh, we've got trumpets, the trumpet doesn't sound very good. That's the tremolo under strings there. <laughs> it's a good sound. Pretty eerie. I'm not sure I actually made the final record actually in the end. So, um, so yeah, after the demo is done, um, I go into a program called Sibelius, which is like a word processor for musical notation and put in the notes individually. This is six parts, so there's three brass and three string lines. This produces individual parts, so you produce your score and the score is what the conductor reads. I suppose it's like, it's like the map that everyone refers to. And Stuart used to do all this by hand um, in the early days with, um, for songs like The Model and Women's Realm, he was there with a the piano and manuscript and um, pencil, and he would do all this by hand. I just started to get interested. We did a few string parts together, and um, by the time of Dear Katashi Waitress, I, I seemed to be the guy that was kind of, you know, bringing all the things together. To, to my mind, it makes something bigger um, than just a band playing in a room. Um, and I guess we, we all, like a lot of records that have a lot of orchestration in it, it's kind of um, it's a kind of aesthetic thing, I suppose. anyone believes there's a long-term future making music along traditional lines, then bluntly, there isn't. That went out in 1999. And I have to say, the prospect of earning the kind of money that you have done in the past are slim to negligible. Now for me, the last six months has felt like, as I think Alan Horn once said, 
doing Kubrick on a Scottish television budget. There is no cash flow because all the money has gone into recording and touring commitments. I'm not saying there's no light on the horizon. It's just fairly dim. Basically what you're saying is we're fucked. You fall over in the street, you get back up again. You run out of milk for your morning macchiato, you simply go to the shop and buy more. You go to a poster arcade to buy your favourite design, perhaps an A3, it's not open. You go back the next day, unless it's a bank holiday, in which case probably best to go back on the Tuesday, or indeed Wednesday. Point being, things normally work out the way they should, and more often than not, for the better. On that note, I give you Bell and Sebastian. <laughs>